Hi, it's Mary Beth Decker with sacredgrove.com. Um, let me take my glasses off. I am an intuitive animal communicator and I'm lucky enough to be here with Dr. Kosen uh, from the Veterinary Holistic Center. Let me just give you a little bit of information about Dr. Kosen. Thank you for being here today. Oh, sure. Yeah. So Dr. Kosen received his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine. He's practiced in Nor Northern Virginia ever since. After practicing general small animal medicine for several years, he was certified in veterinary acupuncture in 1990. At the time, Dr. Kosen was the only veterinarian in Northern Virginia providing this service. Over the next few years, he trained in Chinese herbal medicine and homeopathy. The majority of his appointments were people coming for holistic medicine. Dr. Kosen joined South Paws Veterinary Specialists when they first opened in Springfield in 1995, and he headed the holistic medicine department for 19 years. To increase the availability of alternative therapies for small animals, Dr. Kosen opened the Veterinary Holistic Center in Northern Springfield, and we're still in Virginia, in September of 2015. So I'm so glad to be talking to you today, Dr. Kosen. Um, tell me, again, in your own words, what is the Veterinary Holistic Center? Well, Mary Beth, thanks for having me. I, yeah. love, I love talking about the holistic medicine and certainly about the holistic center. So the Veterinary Holistic Center is in North Springfield. We're a practice that is limited to, uh, we'll call it holistic services, holistic medicine. We don't provide any conventional medical therapies, but focus on non-conventional medicines, alternative therapies, as they're called, or holistic medicines. Predominantly um, acupuncture therapy, um, Chinese herbal medicine, homeopathy. We have two veterinary chiropractors who have joined us. We have a massage therapist and rehab specialist. And of course, we have uh, an animal communicator, yourself, uh, <laughs> who has joined us as well, um, and to continue to look for other services to add that can um, provide care for animals that maybe we can't do from a conventional medicine side. Okay, so tell me, because uh, I'm not a veterinarian, I'm not a vet tech, what, you know, people who are already taking their, their, their animals, dogs, cats, rabbits, I've seen so far to, to their regular vet, when, when do they think about you all, your services? What kind of things come up where, uh, you, you think people should say, wow, I wonder, I wonder if I should do some holistic alternative therapies. So we have, it's an interesting question, a common question. Yes. We have several classes of clients that come in. The majority are people who have been to their regular veterinarian for care, and the therapies either have uh, maybe worked initially but no longer work, we have certainly some cases that just don't respond to conventional medicine because certain conditions are not as responsive to conventional medicine. Um, we have folks which are using alternative therapies or holistic medicines in their own lives, and they're looking to, is this available for animals? Um, if the results will be as good as Western medicine, of course. Um, we have a lot of cases where we integrate therapies, just as we do in Western medicine. You may have surgery and then follow up with medical care. We may have patients that are on medicines, and again, they're doing okay, but they can be better, so we find therapies we can add in to have an integrated medicine approach. Um, interestingly, people come with the next pet much sooner. Once they've seen the kind of benefits that alternative therapies can offer for the general health of the pet, they will often um, maybe certainly see their regular vet for an initial evaluation or early evaluations, but they don't, if they see the therapy's not working, rather than just hoping it will work, they call us sooner with the second pet um, to say, hey, can you guys intervene? Should you intervene? Um, and a lot of people, of course, find us because their friends have told them about the care. Um, I've even had folks tell me that they were walking their dog and somebody said, hey, my dog used to walk that way. You need to go to the holistic center to get some acupuncture. That's <laughs> fantastic. So uh, tell me some tell, tell me some good stories, like favorite stories about uh, some acupuncture patients you've worked on um, you know, or seen some differences and could, I love stories. Yeah. yeah, well, I would say it, it's hard because so many do well. It seems amazing, but I would 
feel comfortable telling people that 80% or more of the patients, particularly with acupuncture, that we use acupuncture with will show improvements. And these are discernible improvements. Uh, the, the clients notice, the spouse notices, the neighbors notice. Uh, as an example, we are seeing an older beagle, a little bit overweight, not dramatically, but a little bit overweight, um, weak in the hind end, kind of stiff, slow getting up, certainly wasn't running around and playing any, uh, doing anything like this, slipping on the floor sometime. And the owner is starting to wonder, is it time for their sake that maybe they're so uncomfortable uh, that it might be time to make a decision? Yeah. They've been on some medications with minimal improvements. And so a friend of theirs, actually their dog sitter said, she's brought several of her dogs to us, so they should bring this guy to us. Um, so she did, and what the exam showed was definitely weakness in the hind end. This is not an uncommon thing for us to see with dogs as they get older, because as they get older, there's less nerve flow to the back legs, maybe there's some arthritis, some muscle loss, so it manifests as hind end weakness. What'll happen, the body's always trying to get better and compensate, so they tend to shift their weight forward and their backs get tight, just like a person would have a tension in their back. Well, that makes it harder to get around. That causes back end weakness, which makes the back even tighter. So when she came in, that's what the examination showed. Good range of motion with the legs. So his, his knees were not the greatest. His hips weren't the greatest, but they were good. Yeah. And that didn't, wasn't enough going on there to account for his symptoms, but he had a lot of back tension. And these are the kind of cases that are very responsive to acupuncture, mainly because acupuncture's main result an early result is muscle relaxation. Um, so we started with acupuncture. Um, we usually start weekly with, for the first few visits, uh, maybe seven to 10 day interval to start off with. First visit, when she came back at number two, no changes. She came back at the third visit. She says, you know, I think he's moving a little bit smoother. He's getting up and down a little bit more often. I definitely felt on exam that his back was not as tight. He had a little more fluidity, a little more movement there. By the next visit, she said, he's trying to go up the stairs. He's trying to get on the couch. Um, he's kind of moving a little more outside. Next visit, he had been to the, uh, to the pet sitter where he stays and she's got several hounds herself. Mm -hmm. And the report back was he's kind of running with the other guys outside or certainly trying to. I That's think fantastic. When I saw him last week, um, this might've been his sixth visit, maybe seventh. And we have stretched him out to like a three week interval. In fact, um, she said he's running around the backyard. So that's just amazing from a short, maybe three months ago where she was thinking quality of life was such a big issue uh, to have such a turnaround uh, with such a non-invasive therapy because the acupuncture is done in the exam room, no sedation necessary. Uh, once the acupuncture needles are placed, the dogs usually, in his case, they just kind of lay down and relax. Some dogs yeah, may walk yeah. around a bit. And then the needles come out after 20 minutes, they go home. So it's a... Um, yeah, non-invasive in that sense, no chemicals need to be used. So no metabolic problems, no need to worry about organ changes down the road. Uh, so really he's a great example. And fortunately, yes, well, not, and, you know, and not honestly, uncommon. Nobody wants, nobody wants to make the decision before they have to, nobody wants right. to let their pet go. And so that is, you know, that, that saves the animal and the person a tough, right. tough decision that actually didn't need to be made. And right. so, how good is that? Even those who have arthritis, and we do see some of the bigger dogs, labs, gold retrievers, German shepherds, yeah. they may have some arthritis in their hips from hip dysplasia or just arthritis. Uh, dogs that have had a torn ACL uh, with or without surgery will have arthritis in their knees. Even with those physical changes, we find many of them are much more fluid, much more comfortable with acupuncture therapy um, because again, we're, it's helping to improve what it can improve helps the body compensate for some of those chronic problems. And for those who are on medication, maybe anti-inflammatory medicines or pain meds, since there's nothing on the acupuncture needles, it's fully compatible. And oh, indeed, right. as they improve, people find they can wean down their doses. They may not be able to wean off, but they can wean down, which right there makes it safer in the long run as well. Oh, wonderful. Uh, well, I, I, love, I love success stories. I love these testimonials, these stories. So tell me, uh, I'm going to switch over to um, the herbs. Mm -hmm. uh, how about that? When, when do people? When should people? I use it that way. When should people start to think? I wonder if you know herbal medicine might help, or um, or should they leave it to you to tell them? But I'm just curious about what stories and when you put people when you, you put the animals 
on herbal medicines and for what kinds of things. If there's some few stories you can tell or examples you can give us that start to think about, geez, maybe I need to do, maybe I need to check with you about that. So generally, we prefer people to let us make the decision. Yeah. You know, we have a variety of therapies available and we're veterinarians also. So we know the strengths of drug therapy, if you will, or if a consult with a specialist might be in order if it hasn't been done. Um, but my experience has been that for the mobility situations, acupuncture works really well. Where the herbal medicines can be very helpful have been a collection of conditions, I guess I would call metabolic diseases, such as liver and kidney changes, either through exposure to toxins, age-related diseases, particularly as dogs and cats age. Kidney disease is not an uncommon thing. And um, chronic skin problems, chronic digestive problems, chronic respiratory problems. But the, the, the key there is chronicity, meaning longer term. These are all longer term inflammatory processes, which anti-inflammatory medicines may or may not control. And if they do, they have their side effects. And if you try to get off the drugs, the problems come back because truly they never went away. You are controlling the inflammation. Herbal medicines, particularly Chinese herbal, which is my training, but herbal medicines in general work to stimulate the body's immune system to try to decrease that inflammation. So in that way, it's safer for the body because it doesn't hurt the liver or hurt the organs because the body doesn't see the medicines as a toxin as it would a pharmaceutical, but also by training or stimulating the body system to work, it gives a much broader effect. It's fixing things in there that we really don't even know about but it, it, the body knows, it just didn't have the capacity to do so, or it wasn't doing the job. Sometimes I tell people the herbs, you know, just kick everything into gear and get the body doing what it can do. So indeed the disease was, it wasn't fixing itself for whatever reason. Um, so that's where we find it helpful. Herbal medicines can be problematic in cats because they don't taste so good. And cats, <laughs> can be but some cats are amenable. So we might use herbal therapies in them when we can, liquids when we can. Um, often they just need a few drops if they're a smaller size cat. Even some of the powders can be mixed in. With the dogs, we tend to use the tablets and maybe some of the powder concentrates or capsules because they can be put in the food and most dogs are not quite as discriminating. Um, herbs can be used for longer term. Again, older animals, older people, your immune system's getting a little bit weaker, so there are some immune tonics, as they call them, which generally enhance immune function without saying, go fix this, go fix that, just in general to boost. You got some of these 14 and 15 year old dogs, everything's getting slow. But it yeah. doesn't mean that there isn't some capacity in there that you can't tap into to just increase the efficiency of how the body's doing. So the overall function is they're more alert, they're more connected. Sure, they sleep a lot, but they're old. But when they're awake, they're more connected. They can do stuff. They still walk slow. They're old. It's okay. <laughs> they say, I'm going to get there. It's okay. They're not in a hurry anymore. That's right. So that's where herbs can be rather beneficial. And as I said, my training is Chinese herbal. I don't use a lot of Western herbs only because I haven't had training in that area. But a good Western herbalist can do just as good, I suppose, as Chinese herbal. Is there one... Is there one um dog or cat that, that just comes to mind when you think about Chinese herbals that you could tell us a story about? Or? Well, you had one dog um, that did, really was behavioral issues, if you will. He was just a little wild on the leash when they took him for walks. Yeah. Uh, he was a bigger hound and fine with people when he saw other dogs. I don't know that it was really aggression, but it, it could be taken that way. But it was just hyper excitability, if you will, and a little more hyper vigilant at home too. You know, looking out the window, people passing by, just you know, a little more vocal than they needed to be, and just you figure, wow, that's all wasted energy. You know, why do that? Uh, you don't need to do that. Um, yeah, so actually, he was. This was a case where we introduced different herbs over time. We made modifications, and then ended up. He ended up being on three different formulas because no one formula really helped. But once we had the right combo, uh, and each one was a lower dose, we didn't need to give a full dose of each one. We kind of gave a low dose of different ones to customize a formula, if you will, to his needs. He did really well for a really long time. Again, he was in recently. As he aged, he started showing some hind end weakness. So we started some acupuncture with him. 
And then the question, of course, came up was like, hey, do you think we still need to keep the same herbs going? And I said, you know, he's older. He probably doesn't care as much. <laughs> maybe his hearing is down a little bit. His vision is down, age-related changes. So we're going to start weaning him down to, again, see if we can get him off of those over time. Many of the cases we see are not curable. They're definitely treatable, but either because of the by the time we see them, it's been going on too long, or the nature of the problem, it can't be cured. So they probably, to get the best benefits, they probably can't get off their herbs. I, the clients can always stop if they want. Uh, and they'll in, ultimately, they'll still be better than they were before we started, but in time, those progression continues. So we find um, continuing at some level of therapy gives the best benefits for most of our patients. Hypothetically, if we could intervene sooner, we could actually nip some of these things in the bud maybe some of these mobility guys where they have this progressive hind end weakness. If we started doing acupuncture when they were younger and they were just starting to slow down and then just do a tune up every three or four times a year, single treatment mm -hmm. would maintain them, uh, which is how it's done in China for people, especially when you start when you're really young. But again, if you don't start till you're older, there's a limit as to how much better you can get and what that interval could be between visits. So that applies to the herbals as well. Okay. That maybe if we knew enough to intervene sooner or, and again, people come with the second pet sooner. So we are seeing quicker results, maybe faster results, able to get off the herbs, maybe, again, depending on the nature of the problem, but long-term use of herbal medicines is so safe compared to pharmaceuticals that there just haven't been any problems. Let, let me ask a question that just came to me. You know, I've been hearing a lot about vaccinosis. Um, uh, reaction to vaccines. Do have you seen that? Have you have uh, any seen anybody not doing well with vaccines or anything like that? Yeah. So what it seems to be, I think there's a bit of a misperception out there, a misconception out there. Please talk degree. about it because I'm hearing a lot um, about it these days. And, and certainly in the holistic world, and my teachers have been covering this topic for a very long time, and now it's coming around to the reviewing it from the conventional perspective too, and. My experience and my belief is it's not so much that vaccines are bad. The problem that comes about is over vaccinate, vaccinating. So my usual joke to clients is I got my puppy shots. I don't have to keep getting boosted. So with clients and with puppies, actually the manufacturers have made some really good vaccines. So when you give them to the puppy, they are truly immunized. And for most viral diseases, which in the dog world would be distemper and parvo and rabies, and in the cat world, feline distemper and rabies, they really have long-term immunity from their juvenile vaccinations. The problem seems to come about when they come back a year later for a quote-unquote booster, if they're immunized or since they're immunized, now the immune system has to fight the vaccine. Um. And right there, a vaccine is an infection. So now you're creating inflammation the body has to get rid of those inflammatory compounds and you're tying up immune capacity. And if you come back a year later and a year later, I don't think it ever catches up. So by year three, year four, year five, you've got a nonstop infection going, man-made, and apparently for no real reason in that they had immunity from the puppy shots or the kitten shots. This wasn't understood in the past. So it's not that veterinarians are you know, bad people, they were working from the information they had at the time, but the current and new information, new tests, particularly a test called a titer test, which okay. measure, that measures the body's immune status to that disease. So if one draws a blood sample on a dog to check the parvo and distemper titer, and it's positive, you don't need a booster. It means if you're exposed to this disease in real life, you can fight it off. But again, if you give a vaccine, the body can't ignore it. It needs to use some of its immune capacity to fight the vaccine, which means it's not in the storage pool to fight allergens, to fight other infections, to keep the normal metabolic processes going. So this is an insidious problem. It's not um, a reaction to a vaccine within a week of giving it or a day later or even a month later. It's the cumulative effects of over-vaccination. More often, this is being recognized at the veterinary schools and they're starting to appreciate this now that we have testing to check the status. And if it worked, you don't need a booster. Many animals are either immune for life or they're immune till you know eight years, ten years, twelve years old, um, and that's a good thing. It, it, so hopefully the the licensing folks will catch up with this too. Right. The and good thing is the only requirement in most states is rabies vaccine. Distemper and parvo and these other vaccines are not required 
by anybody. A clinic may strongly suggest it. A boarding kennel may require it. But I'll tell folks, have a titer done. If your dog's blood test shows that they have immunity, you know your dog has immunity. Not just that he got a shock, but he actually has immunity. It worked. And then you can ask them, hey, is that dog in the kennel next to mine really immunized or is he just vaccinated? Because all vaccinated <laughs> immunized means that it worked. And if it didn't work, what's wrong with your immune system? Now, the vaccines are, again, highly effective and in part long-term immunity. So no need to weaken the system um, if you don't have to, obviously. The, and so over-vaccination is really the disease leading to quote-unquote vaccinosis, which manifests as chronic inflammatory problems, skin problems, respiratory problems, urinary problems. A lot of this is exacerbated by over-vaccination. That's chronic vaccination. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably take notes after this and write that all down. Thank you so much. Um, so I know you, you also have chiropractic, you have massage. Um, any, and it always interests me because chiropractic and acupuncture are totally different and yet they work out, they seem to work on similar issues. So can you talk a little bit about, maybe a little bit about that or how chiropractic might be uh, useful at times or, you know, however. Right. Great question. A lot of the therapies that we have provided by different people here um, do overlap in their ability to get positive results. Each one is unique. Each one has certain strengths and maybe some weaknesses. Uh, again, my training is acupuncture, so I would emphasize that one more just <laughs> yes. experience. But after watching patients that have seen the chiropractors and the kind of patients that they see, um, so in acupuncture, general mobility problems, mm -hmm. certainly very helpful, particularly age-related, older dogs getting slower over time. I think nothing beats the acupuncture. Where, so chiropractic, where it really shines, where it's really good, are agility dogs, middle-aged and younger dogs that are really just very active, maybe people doing a lot of hiking because the people themselves are active and doing a lot of stuff. Um, even go, even going to the dog park a lot, a lot of jumping, turning, twisting, they're relatively healthy, but if you think about it, they're just overdoing. So things are slightly out of alignment. There is definitely some tension along the vertebrae, in the joints. The chiropractors are very well trained to pick up that tension, do some slight adjustments as necessary to take the tension off the muscles and the nerves, which then improve function. Um, our two veterinary chiropractors are also certified in acupuncture, so they actually combine the therapy often where they, and they decide what that emphasis might be depending on the patient. Uh, many times with that, because again, the dogs are quite healthy prior to the visit, often one or two visits and they're done. You can think about it. Now, agility dogs and agility people tend to practice five days a week and then go to trial two days a week on the weekend. Well, no athlete can work seven days a week. So in a way, they're maybe overdoing it with the dog. Those guys would need more support and more adjustment uh, just because of the work they're doing. But as they retire, as they do less, then less work needs to be done. Massage, th massage therapy is really helpful uh, for a lot of older animals, uh, even middle age. The real advantage in my mind to coming from massage therapy is what the massage therapist can show the owner. We all know how to pet our dogs. I kind of tell people, think of massage as focused petting. She tells you where to push, where to pet. She's a specialist. She's the expert. She has the touch. But then on your dog, she says, you know, th feel this. This is how you do it. This is where you stretch. This is where you well, That's push. fantastic. Um, and you, then you go home and do your homework. Uh, and then again, maybe you don't have to come in as often. You can re-up as necessary or if they're no longer responding well, you come in because maybe now it's shifted. With our rehab specialist, which is called physical therapy in humans, but the, we have to call it rehab in animals. Oh, okay, all right. Can be used post-operatively, of course, to get back to function, but a lot of middle age and older dogs benefit there. So I think of rehab as focused exercises. So they will do things to strengthen the core muscles as they talk about in people. Certain exercises are good for stretching. So uh, just simple examples would be, they you have your dog do sit stands. That's like a person doing squats. They would have you go three steps up and have the dog's back feet on the floor and make them stretch up the steps to get a treat. Well, that's a good back stretch. 
If you're on a walk, you, when, you, when you go to the park, they have those bollards to stop the cars going down the trail. You can have your dog walk between those, weave through those like a weave pole. So that also gets them limber and gets them doing well. These are things you can do. And they, again, they give you exercise, they give you homework to do. So the healthier the dog is, the, these are mostly supportive exercises you can do and you don't need to keep coming back in. The older they are, there's more physical pathology. There's things in there that cannot get better to the best of our knowledge, uh, but doesn't mean that there can't be improvements. So they can work out an exercise regimen that you can often work into your regular day. Sometimes with these older guys, you're simply sitting on the floor with your legs extended and making the dog step over your legs back and forth. That's stimulating them neurologically. So when their foot hits your hits your leg, they're like, oh, I have to pick that up higher. And it, it trains them, retrains them to learn how to walk properly, how to walk better. Uh, and then that helps even when they're not stepping over your legs. So yeah. what you can do, it's not like, oh, we have to take yet another half hour out of my day somehow to do my, ex my dog's exercises. There's some of that, but a lot of this is stuff you're doing. You're watching TV anyway, so you may as well do the massage. You may as well do some simple exercises while you're there. And now I, I'm a trained, uh, I was trained in human massage, and my dogs are benefiting. My cats could care less, but yeah. my dogs are loving it. <laughs> so yeah, it's it, and it's easy to do. You, you just rewrite. It's once you figure out how to incorporate it into your daily right. routine, you know, it's a good way of bonding too. It's so learning that is fantastic. Uh, thank you. And, and you, you have a new room set up. Um, I'm going to say hydrotherapy, but I don't know if that's the right word. What a, what a, how's that going to be used? How are people and their, their animals using that? Yeah, so we've recently um, put in our new underwater treadmill, as they call them. You could also call it a water treadmill, I suppose. Um, and this is in addition to really working with dogs with mobility problems in particular with the physical therapist directing that part of the practice and then our, our assistants helping out as well as we move forward. And the idea is that twofold, if you have a dog that you just wanna do more conditioning, you wanna get some strengthening, you can walk them, but you gotta walk you know, a long time possibly. And you gotta find hills and you have to find things to boost up their strength. Well, water therapy, like with our underwater treadmill, is set up so that it, imagine a plexiglass chamber rather large maybe eight feet long and three feet wide and you have we have the dog step into there we close the door we turn on the water which fills up from the bottom and then you turn on the floor the treadmill now as the dog is walking yes they're walking but they're pushing against the water so that resistance therapy is like a person walking in the pool is a lot harder than just walking in, in air absolutely What's really neat about this therapy though, and this, this device is some dogs, maybe they're overweight, they can't walk that far because they're overweight. Maybe they're older and they're a little bit weaker, so they can't walk that far. Of course, they're now getting overweight or gaining weight, losing muscle tone. We can adjust the height of the water to provide a little bit of buoyancy, so it's taking off some of their weight and then turn on the floor. So now they still have to walk, but they don't have to do all the work. It's not swimming. Swimming is a good exercise too, cardiovascular, but if you watch dogs swim, they're paddling with the front and they can cheat with the back legs if they want. They can just drag them or kick every once in a while, whereas yeah. when they're walking, they have to walk. Um, and, you know, because the floor is moving and we can adjust the speed, we can adjust the height. Um, they can, we, we could have them face either way because it goes forwards and backwards. When the session is finished, the water is pulled back out into our storage tank through the filters. And then the dogs are let out, dried off, and that's how the process goes. The water is monitored, you know, for pH and chlorine levels and things of this sort, filtered, warmed. It's not a room temperature because that would be a pretty chilly 70 degrees. Um, so it's up in the 80s, and that seems just about right for most dogs. They feel comfortable with it. We've had quite a few that have started with that and are really showing some promise. Um, one did well with physical therapy, and it was just that extra little bit that the treadmill was able to bring to it that gave him that extra 5%. So now he's almost back to where he was. He's a search and rescue dog. So he's almost back to where he was before. Oh. Uh, it just shows um, treadmill alone can be beneficial. When they've had these knee surgeries, the first thing the surgeon's gonna say is you gotta get some rehab. Some of it is stretching and walking, but think about that. If you can get them into the water, initially with a little more water so they're not as heavy if you will because of the buoyancy of the water and yet they're pushing against the water so you still get the resistance work too as they improve you'll lower the water level maybe 
three quarters of the way up the thigh equivalent. Now they're now they're just kind of working against the water. That's going to really bring that strength back again. Keep the back limber, um, and just you know, and it's a good a bit of a cardiovascular workout as well. Typically, a session would be walking for a few minutes, resting a few minutes, walking a few minutes, resting, building up to the level that they can handle. Thank you. That that's fascinating. Um... Oh, I didn't want to forget because we both have mutual client with bunnies. So you see bunnies as well. And I, I'm wondering what other small animals you, you, know, you can help with. You know? Right. So since we don't actually do any diagnostic medicine here, and even when I was in general practice, I never did bunnies or exotics because that's, that's a whole other world. Yeah. Um, we do see uh, some bunnies here for mobility problems. Generally, okay. they, again, they, their regular vet has helped them determine that's what's going on. Usually radiographs have been done. Even some uh, one of our uh, clinics in our area can even do um, uh, CAT scans for, for bunnies and exotics, which is amazing. Uh, but radiographs, there many times are on medications as anti-inflammatories, um, but still they have some back tension too. And most of that's in the back end because they're bunnies. Yeah. They're, they're relying on those back legs. They don't walk so well. They need to hop. And when they walk, it really puts a strain on their back. So we have found also for those that are um, amenable to it, if you will, um, acupuncture in those cases have been very helpful. Um, I have a lead on a vet in the Midwest who uses herbal medicines with bunnies. So I need to reach out to her to see, is this appropriate with some of these cases? Maybe we can help an even broader array of, the, of that species, uh, of, that, of that type of animal to try to improve their health. But on the mobility, again, the vast majority improve. People will often ask, and here, this usually comes up with cats, is can you do acupuncture in cats? You can. And the answer is some. Oh, Depends some. On the cat. Okay. You know, they're cats after all. You do it only if they allow it. But again, minimal restraint, gentle handling, very small needles. I do work with a fair amount of cats, and they've done well too. Again, mobility problems predominantly, uh, back tension. As cats age, the most common thing we see is kidney disease. Interestingly, acupuncture can be very helpful for kidney disease in older cats. Ah. Number one, some of them are getting some back tension too. And I think part of the kidney disease syndrome is that the nerves to the kidney from the spinal cord are being pinched because of the back tension. Because our nerves don't just go to our muscles, they go to our organs. The organs are sending messages back to the spinal cord for integration. And that's how the system talks to itself is mainly through the nervous system. So relaxing the back muscles, particularly in the areas where the nerves come off the spinal cord, which is right over the kidney. We not only improve back end strength and comfort for some of these guys, but we actually have seen improved kidney function. They still have age-related kidney changes, so but we're getting improved function and then lower rate of decline. We're all on the downhill slide in the big picture, but we can slow down that rate of change. And doesn't everybody want that? You <laughs> you know? We know it's good. inevitable, but not you today. Want to do as well not as you tomorrow. Can, as long as you can, right? Got it. You got it. Well, I, just, I, I, I wonder what I've missed. So um, I will stop asking questions other than to ask, what else should would should we share? Um, so one thing I did want to say about our center, it's a rather large size facility. So the clinic is really in the front part. We've got a large room in the back, um, a 1600 square foot space that trainers use. They do regular dog training, uh, but our therapists also use that as well. It's got a rubber floor. So they'll do some of the exercises back there. We've used that sometimes if an animal comes in and maybe we're trying to figure out which leg is laying. You can't always tell. Is it this side or that side? Is it all four legs? You know, what's happening there? And maybe helping to monitor improvement too, because that rubber floor gives them traction and yet it absorbs some of the shock. So we can kind of gate them in the back room there so they can, uh, we can see how they're moving. That's been helpful. We've had a few seminars here and speaking about the bunnies, we've done some as a, a fundraiser for the Ho House Rabbit Society. They've done bunny yoga here twice. They actually have another event coming up in a few, in about a month or two where they'll use our space. Um, they have some yoga teachers that come in and then they, we close the gate and the, we release the bunnies and they're hopping around while people are getting the yoga session. It's a lot of fun and raises a lot of money for the House Rabbit Society. The other thing that we're looking to do is add more services here. Um, the only restriction is no conventional medicine. There are many wonderful conventional veterinarians in North Virginia, so we don't need to step on their toes. And by not providing those services, they see us as an extension of their practice. So they'll be more willing and have been much more willing to refer patients to be supportive of patients when, when they hear that they've been here or if the client goes to the veterinarian and says, hey, what do you think about acupuncture? 
or what do you think about herbal medicine? They may say, well, we don't offer that, but I've heard it can be helpful, or we've seen patients that have improved, and this is the place to go because we know they're doing good work. Um, there's still certainly a handful of other therapies I'd love to see adding added here, um, mainly helping mobility, but emotional things like Tellington touch and craniosacral and maybe fixing it so we can have massage available every day or have um, chiropractic every day. Right now we're kind of restricted to two days a week because that's the availability of our veterinary chiropractors. So having as many services available as often uh, is beneficial because some people maybe can't come on a Monday when the chiropractor's here, never. So they just miss out on chiropractic therapy um, because they just can't get here on those days. So as we expand those services, we make them more available for more pets in the Northern Virginia area. And we draw from almost as far south as Richmond and certainly into Maryland and DC, uh, not uncommonly west of us. And shockingly to me, you know, almost from the Eastern shore. I'm just amazed that people come that far. Um, there are other vets in the area providing individual services. So we certainly try to make a referral if somebody's gonna be a little bit closer because uh, of traffic concerns and time and so on. I, I tell folks, we're not turning you away. We're just trying to find out what's gonna work best for your pet so that you continue with these therapies. Um, and then that just spreads the word. Uh, as more people know, as more veterinarians know, acceptance increases, more animals get the benefits, and increases that in integrative approach so that animal health um, is better and they do better longer. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, this has been, I've been really enjoying hearing about everything that uh, you, you and you and all the other therapists and, and uh, veterinarians can do, I love this. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. And um, folks, you know, it's uh, the website is vhcnovanova.com. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Okay. We have information on all of our practitioners, a bit about each of the different services, who provides what service. Right. For some of our visiting veterinarians, such as the chiropractors and the massage therapists, Usually they have contact info, they set their own appointments, they set their own agenda for the main acupuncture and physical rehab. Um, people just call our main number and that's all pretty clear on the website as well. Yeah, it is, it is. Okay, uh, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Coson. I appreciate you taking the time. Mary Beth, thanks for having me. I love talking about this as you can tell and it's just, we're okay. really happy having you with us here. I think it's a great service and as you'd imagine, we may be about the only place you could work comfortably <laughs> so far. That's Many, true. Yeah. Thank you. I know. I, I feel it's a it's, great privilege to be part shocked. of the team. They're, they're not shocked when they hear we have a communicator here. So that's, that's right. Wonderful. All right. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm.